Did they do this alone? Can we close the book simply on their, their path to radicalization? What motivated these guys? Did they have some sort of long history, some connections that we should look into more deeply? And I hope that we will before we sort of close the book on these guys. Yeah, well, we do know that they attended the Islamic Society of Boston, a mosque, uh, in the area, and we know that that mosque has hosted a number of pretty radical speakers over the years, people who've attacked the United States, people who've attacked Israel and the Jews by name, uh, one speaker who said that Islam will uh, overwhelm the United States. Um, and right. so we, we know that it, at least for some period of time, they were in this cauldron of, of anti-American um, rhetoric. One man who has made it some of his life's work to study this mosque is a scholar out of um, Harvard named Charles Jacobs. He has been looking into this mosque for years, and he's, here's what he's found. He said that it serves as a front for the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in America, and that there they have people connected to this mosque, he claims, um, have been connected to Al-Qaeda. They have, in fact, tried to funnel funds and money to Al-Qaeda, and that they have uh, hosted people who, in speeches, have said that their goal is to conquer America, to conquer Europe. Uh, so there's all, all sorts of things that are troubling that come out of this mosque, courtesy of this scholar. And on the bottom line there, look on your screen, this guy, uh, this guy Webb, he was the imam of the Islamic Society of Boston. He joined al-Qaeda operative Anwar al-Awlaki two days before the 9-11 attack at a fundraiser. So when you look at all of these pieces and you begin to piece, piece this uh, whole puzzle together, um, and that was, I guess, what was troubling about the president's words the other night when he just basically seemed to say, we're safe now. That's it. We've got them. That's well, he it. also gave us a lecture on diversity, which is, you know, his default mode uh, and commanded us not to reach any conclusions until given permission by the government to do so. But given that this mosque had apparently a history of welcoming extremists, it's a little surprising to learn they received, as the Daily Call reported this weekend, a subsidy from the city of Boston. Basically, they were sold land for a community center um, at about a little less than half the, the actual market value of it. And in exchange, they did good works. They gave lectures to some college nearby. But basically, they got a sweetheart deal, a subsidy from the taxpayers. So Boston, How does that work? Boston subsidized part of this mosque's funding. And That's in fact, shocking. I mean, we know from all of the controversy, you'll remember down at Ground Zero when they were considering building a mosque there, that it was going to be called a community center. Right. And it was going to help serve the uh, lower Manhattan community. And it may very well have. It was never built. However, what they've learned in Boston is that you can call something a community center and you can even have uh, speakers come in, but it also can have... Uh, lots of anti-American and hateful rhetoric. Can you imagine found. if some evangelical Protestant church tried to get a subsidy from the city of Boston to build a religious building? These are exactly the same people, the politicians who run that city and state who are always lecturing us about the separation of church and state. So in other words, churches don't get any sort of land deal. But radical Boston. mosques do. Like, how does that work? I would love to know. I would love to find out who made that decision. I would love to have him on this show and ask him, would you do the same for like an Assemblies of God congregation? I suspect not. We can do that. We can book that, Tucker. We'll find that person. Well, YouTube pages attributed to the Boston bombing suspect show videos praising extremism associated with al-Qaeda. So just when and how did these brothers become radicalized, and what role does the Muslim community play in combating extremism? Joining us now to weigh in is the founder and president of Islamic, I'm sorry, American Islamic Forum for Democracy, Dr. Zudi Jasser. Hi, Zudi. Hi, good morning. How are you? Uh, doing well. Can you just answer that question for us? What today do you wish the Muslim community were coming out to say? You know, I'm really, I have to tell you, I'm disappointed in that many of the organizations are coming out as if they're the victims, saying that, oh, be careful about backlash and the fear, et cetera. Well, listen, America will be resilient, we'll stay together. We as Muslims need to recognize this happened on our watch. This was a Muslim who was radicalized in our community. Look back, instead of denying the link and the radicalization between the political, theopolitical ideology of Islamism and its preaching of grievances and anti-Americanism and anti-Westernism, own up to it, take ownership and say, you know, maybe we need to have programs to counter these things so that they don't end up, when they get isolated, 
going to the internet and getting those final steps of radicalization and bonding with Al-Qaeda. And until we take responsibility and start to say, you know, we have to lead this and be part of the solution, America is going to continue to get more and more fearful about what role we actually play in our silence. So both these brothers apparently attended a mosque at which a number of radical speakers gave barn burning speeches about Israel and the United States. And, um, and this is a story it seems I've read before many times. Uh, is there any effort to, at mosques like this to keep crazy speakers out? Does anybody stand up and say, no, this is not a good idea to have some nutcase railing against Israel in our mosque? Well, well, Tucker, when I went and testified to Chairman King's hearings on radicalization, I talked about speeches in mosques in Phoenix that were, uh, I think, could radicalize American Muslims. They weren't preaching violence, but they were preaching hate of the West and anti-Semitism and, and uh, uh, about our soldiers in Iraq killing Muslims, all these things that could start to alienate Muslims. And I was vilified as sort of an Uncle Tom, and, and King was vilified for actually having hearings. And I think in similar in Massachusetts and in Boston, this Imam Webb who's there has been linked to the Brotherhood, but yet many of his speeches are about peace and tolerance, etc. But when he doesn't take on political Islam, you know, just a week before the bombings, he was on Face the Nation talking about inter, you know, interfaith cooperation as being sort of the representative of peaceful Islam. He was actually going to be the Muslim representative with the president's interfaith uh, service. And then just a few hours, he tweeted that he was no longer going to be it. And they actually brought a more moderate organization representative from the American Islamic Congress. Mm. Uh, Dr. Jasser, stick around if you would. We want to take a quick break. Sure. But we want to hear more about what you recommend on the other side of that. Thanks. Uh, Thank just you. three more minutes till Fox and Friends. We are rejoined by the founder and president of American Islamic Forum for Democracy, Dr. Zudi Jasser. Uh, Zudi, you were talking about how you wish that more law-abiding, peaceful Muslims would come out and condemn these things when it happens. You must have been very heartened by the suspect's uncle, who immediately came out and vociferously said that he completely disavows what these guys stand for. He disavows them. He's disgusted by their actions. He wishes he could turn them in if he knew where they were. Is that the sort of thing you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, at the, at the last steps, absolutely, that's uh, heartening. But, you know, these guys don't get radicalized overnight. His family, uh, you know, in many ways, you listen to his aunt and his mom, they're talking conspiracy theories and, and all this other nonsense about him being framed. So there's other elements, too, in the familial or tribal component of the, the concepts of what actually radicalizes these folks. And, and, you know, it's easy once somebody does an act for many in the community to see, oh, he was kicked out of the mosque when he stood up and yelled something, but then he went back into it. And they don't look at the fact that they may not be preaching violence, but yet this ideology of preaching where America is the problem, the West is not with Islam and anti-Islam, and it, it creates the, the soil in which Al-Qaeda and more violent elements can till their ideas. And unless we as American Muslims teach our youth, we have a liberty project that teaches Muslims in our organization that, you know what, the lens of their identity should be a constitution that separates mosque and state, and that we have to defeat the ideas of the Islamic State. Imam Webb and so many other uh, mosques that I think need to be looked at about their ideas, not from government, but by media and others that have been apologists for many of their ideas. Tell me what you thought of the president's reaction. He, he gave a talk to the country uh, yesterday. In, in, in listening, you really got the sense that he fears that the greatest consequence of this is that the rest of America will become anti-Islamic, there'll be revenge killings, he gave us this lecture about diversity, told us not to pass judgment. Is that the greatest threat and do you feel like Muslims in America are under attack? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, this president just doesn't get it. The, the greatest threat, Tucker, as, as you know and so many know, is what we're experiencing globally with this, in many ways, good Arab awakening that could see flourishing democracy and liberty, but this president doesn't have a doctrine. If he had a liberty doctrine where we'd promote liberal elements, as I talk about in my book, A Battle for the Soul of Islam, there's a battle going on. And this president doesn't want to take sides within the Muslim community and wants to just use us for sort of supporting the minority, when in fact there is a battle going on within the faith that we need to take sides on or else 
the strong horse is going to win. And as long as this administration calls it workplace violence in Fort Hood and, and uses politically correct terms, they can't even say terrorism. How do you expect us to get those stages of radicalization early and work with the right Muslim organizations and foster a counter Islamist movement to fight the petrodollars in all those countries like Qatar and Turkey that right. are growing national and international movements that threaten us and get into the minds of people like the Zanea brothers. Mm. Dr. Zudi Jasser joining us. Thanks very much, Zudi. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Tucker. Thank you. Coming up, new video of the bombing suspect, Jahar Sarnaev, hiding out in a boat as police closed in on him Friday night in Watertown. Wait till you see this infrared video for the first time. We have a live report on his condition after the fierce firefight with police. That's next.